Hello everyone, UXW Bill here with a bit of a confession to make. I have to admit that while it is my goal to answer anyone with a question as long as I have anything even remotely useful to offer them, sometimes things simply slip through the cracks. Likewise, for those who request a video, I have considered video requests since the time that my channel opened and it first started attracting subscribers. But again, sometimes things just fall through the cracks. Today's video is going to be an effort to try and make up for that. What you're looking at here, in case you did not know, is a Procom Technology Compact Disk Server. This is a network attached device that takes the contents of up to seven compact disks and makes them available to other computers attached to a network using a multitude of different protocols. Back when I made a video about this unit, oh, around two years ago or so, I discussed the basic aspects of the hardware, including loading and removing disks, and then in a second video I went back and I talked about the software, specifically this unit's web-based management interface. And while I haven't watched the video in a while, I reckon that I probably also did at least a cursory demonstration of accessing the unit over the network. Well, more than a couple questions came up from people who watched that video, and I'll start off with the one that a couple of people asked, which was, what do the insides of this unit look like? Now, I have to admit, this thing is in my network stack over in the furnace room, where it's kind of hard to uh, extricate without having a whole bunch of things that might potentially want to fall down and shorten me by a few inches. But I had to pull it out today because, as I discovered a while back, the power supply fan wasn't running. I actually had it turned off for the past couple of months because I don't use this unit very often, and I was okay with just turning it on when I needed it. And I said, well, you know, I'll deal with that power supply fan someday. I finally decided that if someday didn't get here by my making it arrive, that I would probably never get around to this. Anyway, here's the power supply, and it's going to need a little more attention than just a fan, which I have already gone ahead and fixed. There are also a couple of capacitors that have become bloated over in the output side. Now, this power supply by itself is really nothing too special. It's basically an AT-style power supply that does not have power connections for a motherboard, as there really is no motherboard in here, but I'll get to that in just a moment. Otherwise, the wiring is everything you would pretty much expect it to be. There's a connection coming out of the power supply here with this little green wire that goes to a front panel power LED, and then this cable right here actually goes to the power switch. All of these old AT-style power supplies have one thing in common, and that is to say that line power is actually directed to the front panel power switch. doesn't take a genius to see that ATX was a safety improvement in that regard because it reduces the potential for line voltage to come into contact with the case, thus giving the user a shocking and even potentially fatal experience. Another connection coming out of the power supply that you won't see on the average AT style power supply is this yellow and black wire which goes up here to two top mounted fans. Now unlike the Roach Palace Linux box, this thing makes no pretense at keeping the noise level to a minimum, although it does manage to pull quite a bit of air through the case. Which is why I was not too worried about operating the power supply, even though its own fan wasn't working. These two fans up here pulled more than enough air backwards through the power supply to keep it comfortable and cool. Now moving over, you can see that there are power connections to four of the CD-ROM drives right there. You can also see a ribbon cable that links them. Internally, this unit uses the Small Computer System Interface, SCSI, pronounced SCSI to interconnect the drives and allow them to communicate with the server unit. Now the server unit is up here, and while it is badged Procom technology, it was actually made by a company that's still in business today known as Axis Communications. These days, Axis Communications is no longer in the network CD server market as they used to be. Today, they produce network devices for use with security and surveillance cameras. What's very interesting about this device, I had never popped the cover on it. Well, today I finally changed that because I was bored and curious. It seems that rather than Axis choosing to use a conventional off-the-shelf CPU or even someone else's system on chip, they developed their own. As if that weren't amazing enough, they also published a complete technical reference 
for the CPU and system on chip that this thing uses, which means, at least in theory, that someone who is capable of doing so could write their own operating system software for this unit. As it stands right now, the processor in this thing is a 32-bit MIPS-based unit with a number of peripherals on board, including the SCSI host adapter and the networking hardware. Now, it should be mentioned while I'm talking of the network hardware that if you should find one of these for your very own and it has been broken out of the case or you have to take it separately from the case, that you probably want to make sure to grab this cable as Axis warns us that this is not a conventional Ethernet patch cable despite the fact that it actually ends up going out to a connection on the back where an Ethernet cable may be plugged in. I don't know how true that is, but you might want to take my advice, grab that cable if you see it, and save yourself a potential bit of hassle. Also present inside this unit is a clock backup battery. It was manufactured in 1999, but as little as I've had this thing powered up, I was actually rather surprised to see that the clock battery was still good. And let me just tell you folks, when I got it hooked up to the network and I signed into the web interface, there was no issue with year 2000 compliance. Boy, oh boy, was this thing year 2000 compliant when I started it up. It was way out in 2036. <laughs> so I had to reset the date manually as for some reason it couldn't seem to pull it off using network time protocol. I don't know if some of my DNS settings are incorrect or if I've left them at values that were only appropriate for my old internet service provider. There is one more thing of interest inside this unit, a memory expansion slot. By default, this thing comes with four megabytes of ROM to hold the operating system firmware and related programming, and 32 megabytes of RAM that is used not only to keep the system running, but also for the purposes of a data cache, which would help it to avoid having to spin up a particular CD-ROM drive if a, if a piece of data that is often being requested will fit into the cache memory. A memory expansion slot on the board in this unit allows you to install up to 128 megabytes of additional memory, which when used in conjunction with the 32 megabytes of onboard memory, will give you 160 total megabytes of random access memory. There were also a couple of people who made the following request, which is really better explained by video than anything I could say. Just watch. Now a couple of people inquired as to the other capabilities of this unit if there were any. And at the time, when I made the first two videos discussing it, I told them that I felt it was only possible for this unit to take files from compact disks in any of the seven drives and serve them out to computers waiting on the network. I took the time today to download and read the Axis Communications Manual for this unit, and I discovered that I was actually selling it, well, a little bit short of its full capability. It turns out that if there were to be a compact disc recorder burner attached to this unit, that it is in fact capable of writing CDs over the network. Users would be able to place files in a specially named share that represented the burner. That could be named almost anything. It would depend upon the administrator of the device. And then, prior to the CD's ejection, steps would be taken to finalize it and prepare it for use in many types of computers equipped with optical drives. Another feature of this unit that I did talk about, at least in the comments area on the previous videos, has to do with the presence of an optional hard drive. If you were willing to sacrifice one of the attached CD-ROM drives in this unit, or you had the dual-channel SCSI version of this server, it's possible to attach a hard drive that could then be used to cache the contents of a couple of different compact disks, depending upon the capacity of the hard drive itself. This would allow the original compact disks to be stored safely away. It would also allow this unit to serve the contents of more compact disks than the number of drives that are actually attached to it. However, perhaps the most important question is the one that has remained unanswered for the longest, and I actually feel kind of bad about this. People asked if the unit would read a DVD. The Axis Communications Manual hints that it will. 
just like it can burn a CD. However, I did not own a SCSI DVD ROM drive, and it is due to the kindness of another YouTuber, specifically I believe it was fellow YouTuber MJM Computers, who kindly sent me a SCSI DVD ROM drive. And what did I do, folks? I promptly misplaced it. Well, we were cleaning up the dining room about two months ago in preparation for Thanksgiving dinner, and what do you know? This drive showed up. So guess what, everybody? It's well past time to answer the question, can this unit read a DVD? What I'm going to go ahead and do here, I'm going to actually go ahead and remove this uh, Panasonic 8-speed CD-ROM drive. This was pulled from an old Apple computer and used to replace one of the original NEC 12-speed drives in this unit that had completely failed to work. It is, however, much slower in not only read speed, but also speed on the SCSI bus. There's really not a whole lot involved in installing this drive. I'll have to go ahead and remove this one. Then I will move this drive down, but not before I go and take a look at the ID jumpers on the back so that it can be reconfigured appropriately for its new position in the SCSI chain. For those not familiar with the setup, in a SCSI system such as this, each device has an ID that basically functions as its address. In this system, the CD drives are numbered 0 through 6, with the controller, or in this case the server unit, taking ID number 7. So I will be pulling this drive at ID number 5, assigning ID 5 to this drive, and then assigning ID 6 to this drive, and putting it into the system. The other thing that will have to be considered is SCSI termination, but in this case I shouldn't have to change anything because the server itself terminates one end of the chain electrically and Procom Technologies also provided a SCSI terminator down here at the other end of the chain. You could think of a terminator in very crude terms as a device that stops electrical signals bouncing or reflecting back and keeping the SCSI chain from working properly. I must admit that I will never understand why someone at Procom Technologies felt the need to use eight screws on each and every drive installed in this enclosure. Now of course only a very silly person would put this unit all the way back together without testing it first. I may be a relatively silly person, but I'm not that silly. So let's take a look here at what we see in the web-based interface. There's the new drive at ID 5, which is the previous ID 6. And then here is the Toshiba DVD-ROM. So we are inching closer here. Now if anyone out there happened to be wondering just what it was that I was going to try to do with the newly installed DVD drive, well, I was going to see if I could play a video DVD over the network. Wouldn't that be a fun little experiment? Unfortunately, this Toshiba drive and I definitely agree on one thing, and that is to say neither one of us are at all fond of these Universal Studios dual-sided DVDs. In fact, I think that I ought to use this thing to try and rectify the situation, but I guess that if I did, a bunch of my DVD collection would probably disappear. And let's just say that experiment didn't exactly go well. I think that the majority of the problem is probably this DVD-ROM drive, as it was extremely reluctant to achieve focus lock on any DVD disc that I tried, including a couple of data discs. Likewise, it was also very, uh, very difficult to get it to achieve focus lock with a compact disc. So I don't know if the laser in this drive has simply aged to the point where it's no longer reliable, or if something in the optical path might actually be slightly out of alignment. It's hard to tell for absolutely sure. I did go on eBay to check out the pricing on these things, and they're actually kind of expensive, so I don't know that this experiment is one that I'm going to be excessively eager to revisit unless I come across an absolutely screaming deal on one of these things, which is very odd, as I would have expected them to be much more common, and therefore at least a little cheaper than they are. What I will say in closing, is that DVD video over the network by way of this thing actually does seem feasible. I was able to get the drive to cooperate for just a little while, and when I did, the result was entirely watchable using VLC. But then, of course, the drive lost its mind, and VLC basically headed for the hills, screaming 
that the wolf was coming. <laughs> so thank you for watching and feel free to leave a comment if you have one.